and chapter 22. We will be reading verses 14 through to 38. This is God's word. And when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. For who is the greater, one who reclines at table, or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as the one who serves. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you, as my Father assigned to me, a kingdom, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. And he said to them, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said nothing. And he said to them, but now let the one who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack, and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. And they said, look, Lord, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. Amen. Here we have now in this chapter of Luke, chapter 22, and uh, we're moving now into the shadow of the cross, and we look at the, what is indeed the last day of our Lord's uh, earthly ministry, and uh, a few things that we consider tonight. We consider the Passover and the institution of the Lord's Supper and the announcement of his uh, betrayal. And also we'll (coughs) look at the position of the apostles in uh, the future kingdom and also uh, Peter's denial, which was foretold here in this passage. And uh, finally, hopefully we'll look too at the uh, time when Jesus warns his disciples uh, of the future. Well, firstly then the Passover and the institution of the Lord's Supper. I think it would be uh, difficult to enter into the meaning of this section that we're looking at without some 
knowledge of the nature of the Jewish uh, Passover feast, especially in the manner in which the various elements of the Passover meal followed each other. And so I'm really thankful for uh, one commentator who gave us a brief outline to help us in this. And so here's a brief description, and the main elements were as follows. And the first one, number one, is a, a prayer of thanksgiving by the head of the house in a general sense. This is what would happen, the drinking of the first cup uh, of what was diluted wine. And secondly, the eating of the bitter herbs as a reminder of the bitter slavery in Egypt. And also, thirdly, the son's inquiry in the general sense, the son of the family would say, why is this night distinguished from all other nights? Followed by the father's appropriate reply, narrated or read. And then fourthly, the singing of the first part of the Hallel, that's the Psalms 113 to 114, which would be sung. And then there'd be washing of the hands and then the second cup would be offered. And then there was the carving and eating of the lamb. <clears throat> and together with the unleavened bread, the lamb was eaten in commemoration of what the ancestors had been commanded to do on the night when the Lord smote, remember the firstborn of Egypt and delivered his people. And it's all there for us in Exodus uh, chapters 12 and 13. And then the unleavened bread was in the commemoration of what was described as the bread of haste eaten by the ancestors as they were prepared to leave Egypt. And also the continuation of the meal, uh, each eating as much as you liked as the men would be there eating of uh, the meal and uh, also down to the last of the lamb. And that was the third cup. <clears throat> we think it's the third cup, in fact, that we see the institution of the Lord's Supper and then singing of the last part of the Hallel, <coughs> Hallel which was Psalms 115 to 118. <coughs> and then there was a fourth cup. Uh, so Luke's account, although not strictly uh, chronological, it is certainly orderly for us. So when we consider these opening verses here, and when the hour was come and sat down and the twelve apostles with him, and reclining at the tables were these twelve disciples, and the soul of Jesus was moved with deep emotion, to which he said with words described in Luke alone, in verse 15, for with desire I have desired to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. And Luke 12, 50 reminds us there what he said, I am straightened or I am constrained. I am pressed. There was, or if you like, there was a, a longing in, indeed to be uh, with the disciples. Indeed, he said, I have desired to eat this Passover with you, our Lord said. It reminds us of John 13 <clears throat> and verse 1 where it says there, now before the feast of the Passover when Jesus knew that his hour was come that he should depart out of this world unto the Father having loved his own which were in the world he loved them to the end. There was this wonderful relationship that the Lord Jesus had with his disciples. His disciples. And Jesus <clears throat> knew what his death within a matter of hours now would do for them and of course for millions of others. He loved the disciples with a love which really cannot be described in words. And he says this in this passage here, before I suffer, before I suffer in verse 15, the Lord realized that this suffering will not be the end. It would be the means of achieving glory for his disciples, for himself. And it is <clears throat> this reason that he immediately adds, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. <clears throat> so in effect, Jesus was saying, I will never eat it again until its symbolic meaning has been fully realized in the new heaven and the new earth. It then tells us that there will be a deliverance 
for his people, uh, not from Egypt, but from all sin and all evil, and it will be fully accomplished. And it is there they at last will be fully redeemed. It is there that the fellowship between himself and all the redeemed will be perfected. And in verses 17 and 18 here, and we're told, and he took the cup and gave thanks. How important that we should give thanks when we remember the Lord's Supper, when we remember the Lord Jesus Christ, when we remember the price that was paid, it is appropriate and right that we give thanks. <clears throat> I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. <clears throat> and we can assume that the cup mentioned was the first one that followed the opening prayer in the order of the Passover feast, which I just briefly outlined. And the drinking of the cup was <clears throat> definitely part of the Passover meal. By ordering the contents of the cup to be divided by all who were present, all the disciples, Jesus was acting as the host, emphasizing the unity of the believers as they partook of the meal. Now, how important that is, that we can recognize the unity that we also have as we uh, take partake of the Lord's Supper. And it's important to remember as well that these verses correctly and indeed should show us a renewed expectation. Jesus is not saying to the disciples, this is the end after tonight, we'll never see each other again. No, no, he wasn't saying that. And what the Lord was saying, in effect, <clears throat> though our continued fellowship here is about to end, it will be renewed in the glorious kingdom to come, a kingdom of light, a kingdom of love, of triumph, of praise, and this indeed throughout eternity. And so what a fulfillment, what a reunion that will be when the meaning of the Passover will be indeed experienced in all its fullness, when all the wickedness of the world will end, <clears throat> when those, those who are grown and weary and cumbered by this world and all the struggles that we face will finally be put to rest. And at that point, as Isaiah 11 verse 9 reminds us, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. <clears throat> it was while towards the close of the Passover meal, the men were all eating freely that Jesus instituted the new sacrament to replace the old, well, I think it was just the third cup of this sequence here. And this explains why both <clears throat> here in Luke's account in verse 20, and also Paul in the first Corinthians 11, 25 speaks of the cup of the supper. <clears throat> now he speaks of the cup after supper and a few more hours and the old symbol uh, being of blood for required the slaying of the lamb, as you remember, will have served its purpose forever, reaching its fulfillment in the blood shed at Calvary. And it was time, therefore, that the new symbol replaced the old. But nevertheless, by historically linking the Passover and the Lord's Supper together, Jesus was making it clear to us that what was essential in the first was not lost in the second. Both point to Jesus Christ, remember, the only and all-sufficient sacrifice for the sins of his people. And the Passover points forward to this, and the Lord's Supper points back to this. When the Lord Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me, he said, as we know, as it's recorded in verse 19. It was the desire of the Lord that by means of the Lord's Supper, the church should remember his sacrifice and to love him. The church should reflect on that sacrifice and embrace him by faith and in so doing to look forward to his glorious return. How important that is. We have also in view the Lord's presence with us 
through the Holy Spirit. Remember the scriptures elsewhere. It says in Matthew's gospel, chapter 18, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them, he said. <clears throat> that the Lord's presence is with us in the Lord's Supper as well, of course. Believers in Christ take and eat. They acknowledge Christ by means of living faith and are strengthened in the faith as well. So it's important for us to remember Christ has given us this plain command, hasn't he? This do in remembrance of me. Well, verse 20. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying this cup is the New Testament in my blood, or the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. <clears throat> so why does the Lord speak of a new covenant? Well, when we think of passages, for example, in uh, Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 4, and there he says there, therefore, it is faith that it might be of grace to the end, that the promise might be sure to all the seed, and not to that only which is of the law, but to that which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And again, Paul's letter to Galatians in chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, where he says, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall nations be blessed. So then, they then which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So do these passages then clearly teach the old covenant, the one made with Abraham, the father of us all, is still in force? Well, they certainly do. Nevertheless, there has been a radical change, something so significant that Jeremiah 31, verse 31, could speak of something which looked into the future. It could speak of a new covenant. And this new dispensation would be that for believers, the law is no longer written on tables of stone. I remember when God gave this to Moses. But it will be written on their hearts. The Holy Spirit, which has been poured out into these hearts. So Jeremiah tells us there that we would... Uh, it would be something not just for Jew, but also for Gentile as well. It would be a much more wider dispensation. Also, this new covenant is no longer something which was exclusive to God and to Israel, but between all believers, regardless of race and nationality. What a tremendous thing that is for us to to see here and also as well this uh, cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you in verse 20 shed for you the expression takes us back to passages such as uh, Exodus 24 verse 8 and Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said the blood of the new covenant remember there that the Moses sprinkled the blood on the people the cleansing for forgiveness. And also in Leviticus 17, 11, where it reminds us, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your sins. And of course, the writer to Hebrews reminds us in chapter 9, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And therefore, if there's no shedding of blood, there's no covenant. No special relationship, no friendship between God and his people. Reconciliation with God requires blood. Now, since man is unable to provide such a sacrifice, a substitutionary sacrifice accepted by faith is required. And in Romans chapter 3, when Paul writes, being justified freely by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, to be declared right by his grace, to think that he would redeem us by his back, 
the blood who was spilled when God had set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. To think that God's wrath was poured out on his son and not on us. What grace he's shown us. What mercy. And when we think what as well, I just want to quote from J.A. Packer as he says, what quenched God's wrath and redeemed us from death was not Jesus' life or teaching, uh, not his uh, moral perfection, nor his fidelity to the Father as such, but the shedding of his blood in death, unquote. It was his blood spilt at Calvary for you and I. And Jesus said, as we know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me, he said. Jesus said, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go out and find pasture. That is, it's through him, through his blood. If we want communion with God, it's through Christ and through him alone. And the writer of Hebrews again reminds us, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, that he's made this possible for us, that now we can have this communion with him, that through his pierced side, his blood, his body nailed there, that blood spilt for us. And as somebody wrote, a door of hope, hope, hope is open wide in Jesus' pierced hands and side you know how important that is for us when we think of what he did for us at calvary to bear away our sin to think that his blood was poured out for many to think that he paid that penalty in full for sinners such as you and i to set us free from sin its slavery its dominion well now we move on because in verse 21 of our text, Jesus announces his betrayal. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table, he wrote. The one who was about to betray the Lord was in their midst. Now Luke does not give us the chrono chronological order of events here, but he gives us the facts necessary for his commentary for us uh, in john john's gospel in chapter 13 verses 18 to 30 john john's account gives us uh, a much more complete narrative and just to uh, with this in mind just to look at that very briefly because here that we see in those verses in john 13 jesus and judas come to a head we see at this point the evil of Judas contrasted with the absolute purity of the Lord Jesus Christ. The treachery of Judas was pushed to its climax now. And Jesus unmasks Judas as the betrayer. In John's account, uh, Jesus said in John 13 verse 18, I speak not of you all, I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Well, the Lord here was quoting from Psalm 41, verse 9, stressing the fact of God's sovereignty even over the evil that men do. The psalm in the free, in that, uh, the phrase in that psalm, rather, lifted the heel. It portrays brutal violence, the raising of the heel to crush one's adversary. That is what Judas tried to do to Jesus. Prophecy there. And within a few hours, Jesus would be betrayed and sold into the hands of men who would put him to death. The disciples were never to think that something had gone terribly wrong with this eternal plan and purpose of God. And all appearances aside, evil had not overthrown righteousness, rather that the cross was ordained by God for a good and holy purpose. In verse 22 of our text then, and truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man 
by whom he is betrayed. Jesus, the one who through the path of humiliation moves to glorification and was indeed glorious from the very beginning. The Lord Jesus goes, it says in this uh, particular account. He goes means that he lived on earth. He suffered. He died. All this not a victim of circumstances, but as it was determined, it says, as it was predicted by the prophets. When we think of Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22, for example, and establishing God's eternal decree. It was necessary for the Lord Jesus to emphasize this truth once again, as it was so difficult for the disciples to reconcile themselves with the idea that the Messiah should die. And as the Lord went to the cross and who suffered and died there, it gave time for the disciples to reflect upon this solemn statement that they may understand the death of Christ does not mean the triumph of his enemies, but it demonstrates God's gracious, sovereign, and indeed ever victorious plan. However, nowhere in Scripture do predestination and prophecy cancel human responsibility. So also here we see a cry of sorrow and pity. Woe unto that man, as we read. Woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. It fully maintains the guilt and doom of Judas. We know that he didn't truly repent and now faces an everlasting damnation. What makes his guilt even the more heavier is the fact that not only did he plan the treachery and took the next step that was volunteering to deliver Jesus to the enemy and then accepting 30 pieces of silver, but even now, despite Christ's many warnings, goes right ahead. And we think indeed in John 13 and the narrative there and... <coughs> And the Apostle Peter says uh, to John, find out from the Lord, who is it, Lord? Who is it? You know, it was, you can imagine around this table, they were reclining a rather reclined position, posture, as they took of the, the elements and they were together. And it was John, remember, who went up, who is it, Lord? And it was the one, he said, who puts the salt into the, bowl with him together and there we see don't we the treachery of Judas and that Satan had entered in to Judas even at that point and he went out and it was night John's gospel tells us it was night and it was night in Judas's heart but the Lord Jesus Christ knew all about this he was completely in control don't forget of the whole situation and through, through his treachery, Judas, I think, supplies sinners with a, a solemn warning. We'll learn from his example that a person, you see, can be very near to Jesus Christ and yet be lost and damned forever. Nobody was ever closer to Christ than those 12 disciples. Judas was one of them, but nevertheless, he's in hell today. Well, he might have given perhaps intellectual assent to the truth. He never embraced Christ with any heartfelt faith. He was false. He feigned to have understand the truth. But he was a clever hypocrite. For nobody suspected him. He had everyone fooled except the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who knew his very heart. So wherever God's work is done, friends, there are, are imposters like Judas. There will always be hypocrites among the brethren. Satan's favorite trick and those he uses is to be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. Reminds us in 2 Corinthians 11. And again, like Judas, such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And there are false religions and cults who do exactly that. 
and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. The devil himself is a master at making his work look very good, isn't he? And he is busy at work amongst the Lord's people, I have to say. So we need to be on our guard. Brethren, we need to be watchful. The NIV version of 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, tells us this, examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? Do we examine ourselves? Are we staying close to Jesus Christ? Something that we need perhaps to think about more. There are those, sadly, who are of, who will fail the test, who are reprobate, it says in my AV here. Remember the, uh, the passage where Jesus talked about the wheat and the tares, you see. There will be a day of accountability. There will be a day when they will be brought to account for their deceit, their hypocrisy, just like Judas. When we move on in this next section, verses 24 to 30 now, the dispute about greatness here with the disciples. And it would seem, I think, that this event took place at the very beginning of the feast. And perhaps we could picture the scene. Here was Jesus about to lay down his life for these men. And Jesus had sent his, his attention on their needs, loving them very tenderly and intensely. And John 13, verse 1 again so Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world. He loved them unto the end. And it's also reflected, of course, in John chapter 17, in that great prayer of our Lord to his heavenly Father. And yet, as the heart of Jesus went out to the disciples, they are quarreling about the question, who is the greatest? Who is the greatest? And what made their attitude even more offensive was the fact that they'd already been reprimanded on previous occasions with regard to their selfish attitude. And remember, for example, in Luke chapter 9, where uh, we, we see something about this, and it said there, and Jesus, perceiving their thoughts of their heart, took a child and set him by him, and said unto them, Whosoever shall receive this child in my name receiveth me, and whosoever receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. For this, for that is least among you all, the same shall be great. And it seems as well, of course, our culture today is obsessed, isn't it, with self-esteem, self-love, self-fulfillment, and every type of selfish pursuit. People promote themselves praise themselves, put themselves first. And probably we've seen people like that, people we rub shoulders with on a daily basis who do that. And perhaps the current gauge of self-worth is the endless mundane details people have of themselves on their social media. And obsession with oneself is not only deemed acceptable today, but it is considered normal behavior. Our culture has made pride a virtue, and humility a weakness. And yet the scriptures are very clear. Pride and being self-centered are hostile to Christian godliness. And both in the life of Jesus and in his teaching constantly uphold the virtue of humility. Nowhere was that made more clear than that was described in John's gospel here in the 13th chapter and in verse 25 then uh, of our text Jesus had again shown that these men that their egotism was really a worldly pagan trait he reminded them of the self-centered attitude of the kings of the Gentiles and these men were exercising their authority don't forget ruthlessly nevertheless took delight to call themselves benefactors it tells us and indeed, on the coin of the realm at that time, the denarius Augustus was called God. 
and on a copper coin, Tiberius was described as one who served to be adored. Nothing new, is it? Sadly. In verses 26 and 27, what did our Lord say? But ye shall not be so, but I am among you that he that serveth. Jesus wants his disciples to be of an opposite mind and their attitude to reflect that. And Jesus told his disciples, the greatest among them is the one who regards himself as such or should, or should become like the youngest, that is, is the one who was of the least honour. The youngest mentioned here is in line with normal conditions of Old Testament, as these men knew, and as old age being honourable and to be held in respect. But I'm sure that at some point they remember the story and the events of Rehoboam in 1 Kings 12, when Rehoboam sought the advice of the younger men and not the elders. And therefore, the consequences were grave. And I'm sure the disciples must have remembered that. And remember also, Jesus said, but I am among you that he that serveth. He was not literally serving them. He, was he not serving them in a way which should never be forgotten? We should remember this. The Lord washed the disciples' feet. Here he was. He washed the disciples' feet. Jesus' humility really is the real lesson. It is practical humility that governs every area of our life and experience of life. That kind of humility is always loving service, doing the menial, humiliating tasks for the glory of God. You see, that demolishes, I think, the, some of the most popular ideas about what true spiritual leadership looks like. Genuine closeness to God is seen in the act of serving somebody else. There was never any sacrificial service to others that Jesus was unwilling to perform. So why should we be any different? And indeed in John 13 again, where it says, and Jesus said, Verily I, verily I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. If we truly want to be blessed and fulfilled, we really do need to develop a servant's heart. If we are his, then we're his slaves. We're bought, don't forget, with his own blood. And a slave is not greater than his master. If Jesus can step down from the glory of heaven and equality with God in order to become a man and further humble himself to be a slave to wash the feet of 12 undeserving sinners, we ought to be willing to suffer any indignity to serve him, should we not? That is true love. That's true humility. Well, verse 28 what does our Lord say here? He says, ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. You know, the Lord is so gracious to these men, isn't he, at this point. The Lord Jesus ignores many of the failings of these disciples and indeed here at the Last Supper praises them for their faithfulness. They have shown the Lord through his many trials. Remember that in John 6, many had turned away from the Lord. They turned back. They ignored the gospel. They turned away. Yet these disciples, except Judas, have been loyal to Jesus. And I think this faithfulness had been beautifully expressed by Peter in John 6. Again, where he says, Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it was Peter who could say that. Can you say that tonight too? I trust you will. We thank God he does not treat us as we deserve, does he? He's gracious to us. Isn't he such? So loving, so kind. As he was to those disciples so long ago. 
And I'm reminded from Isaiah 42, a bruised reed shall he not break and a smoking flax shall he not quench. And like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame. He remembers that we are dust. How gracious our God is. How wonderful he is. How mighty and yet he cares for us. Maybe stay close to God and continue to, to say, Lord, you know it, that I love you. Did you say that this morning in your prayers? Lord, I love you. Do we have that true humility, a grace, that loving relationship with our God through Jesus Christ? Well, here we move on. And verses 29 and 13, here we say, it says here in our text, and I appoint you a kingdom as my Father hath appointed me unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Well, these were the, the Lord's parting legacy to his disciples. He knew that in a few hours his ministry among them would be ended. He brings these things to a conclusion by a wonderful declaration of good things laid up for them. And perhaps we may not see the full meaning of all this in our passage. And every part of the promise, enough to know Jesus promised these 11 faithful disciples glory, honour, rewards, far exceeding anything they had done for him. He assures them that they will enjoy a recompense worthy of a king. May that be a source of encouragement to us as well, and that the wages that Christ will one day give to his believing people will far, be far out of proportion to anything that we have done for him. That their least desires to serve the Savior will be recorded. The weakest efforts to glorify him will be found in his book of remembrance. Not a cup of cold water will miss its reward. How gracious our God is that indeed that he will certainly be a, such a, a wonderful, uh, magnificent uh, God to give us this and to provide for us far out of proportion of anything that we've ever done for him. We should take much encouragement from that. Whichever way we look at things, whichever service we may be in, whichever way we, we might think, you know, that we need to remember that our God sees and knows all this. And so we move on here. So Peter's denial now foretold in Jesus warns his disciples. Well, what does our Lord say here in verse 31? And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. The repetition of his name here suggests an urgent, somber tone of warning. Christ himself had given him the name Peter, but here he reverted to his own name, perhaps to emphasize Peter's fleshly overconfidence. Satan hath desired to have you. Though addressed specifically to Peter, this warning embraced the other disciples because the pronoun you here, uh, by the way, is in the plural. So it was addressed to the whole group of the disciples. And I think also one thing to, uh, to remember that we seldom realize that beyond the struggle that goes on with our own hearts and the uh, conflict between opposing forces on earth, uh, there is probably an even more intense encounter in the spiritual world. And the ardent desire of Satan, yes, his insistent demand had been countered by the prayer of the Lord Jesus for Simon's conversion, that he may sift you as wheat. The word translated sift from the Greek means to shake in a sieve, by inward agitation, to try one's faith to the verge of being overthrown. So what Jesus was saying was the disciples will be subject to severe trials, and they will be. The trial will happen on the, on the very night, and probably later too. Remember, this was quite an in, intense uh, narrative now. These are the last few hours of our Lord's life. And all Simon and Peter's confidence will be gone. And all that will remain is God's sure foundation. Peter will have been awakened through his 
to his true condition. He will no longer function independent of the Lord. As later on in the passage, as it unfolds, you will see. And Jesus was indeed predicting what would happen to the whole group of disciples. The Lord knew that Peter would deny him, and yet he said, I have prayed for thee that your faith will fail not. You know, that is wonderful, isn't it? That we have a Savior who prays for us. You may not have prayed for yourself, but remember the Lord Jesus prayed for you. He prayed for you, prayed for me. There's many instances perhaps we've gone through. Difficulties, trials. Times when perhaps we've, we have forgotten the Lord. Maybe we've drifted away, you know. The Lord prayed for us. The Lord today is our intercessor. He knows when you and I are moving to a place of stumbling, doesn't he? And then for the believer, Jesus has always prayed for you that your faith does not fail, as it was for Peter. And the reasons that your faith and my faith doesn't fail, because he's prayed for you and me. Indeed, this is a wonderful picture, isn't it, of Jesus' love for us. And remember, we have a great high priest who ever lives to intercede for us. And I'm reminded from the great Puritan divine Thomas Watson, who once wrote, he pleads our cause in heaven and takes no fee. An ordinary lawyer will have his fee and sometimes a bride too, but Christ is not a mercenary. How many causes does he plead every day in heaven and will take nothing? As Christ laid down his life freely, so he intercedes freely. That is our God, isn't it? The Lord Jesus Christ, who ever lives to intercede for us. And so, as we look in this passage then, and verse 33, well, what is our Peter here? And he said, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. Well, I'm sure Peter must have meant every word that he said. And yet he really didn't know himself, did he? Many of us don't really know how weak we are when we think about it. Jeremiah 17, 9 reminds us the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We have to be on our guard here, brethren. He knows us completely. He knows our every weakness. I'm reminded from another hymn, Stand in his strength alone, the arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. We stand in his strength. And perhaps maybe... We need to pray like the psalmist in Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. How much more, perhaps, we need to think about that. Well, Peter, in verse 34, and he said, I tell you, Peter, the cock shall not this day crow before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Simon Peter simply did not believe that he could deny his Lord, but he did, even before the night was over. Well, to finish these few verses in verses 35 to 38, the disciples were provided when the Lord sent them out previously, remember, two by two, into the minister, to minister to the house of Israel, to share the kingdom of God. They lacked nothing, but now Jesus was going to send them out on a new mission and with a new message. This time to take the message not just to Israel, but to the whole world. But now when Christ had sent them out before, he had sovereignly arranged for their needs to be met. And now from this point on, they are to use the normal means to provide for their support and their protection. So the money bag, knapsack, sword, were all figurative expressions for such means. The sword represents Protection, not aggression. However, the disciples really took this literally. And we too, as well, have to be prepared to serve the Lord in the situations he has put us. How much then is there an importance to pray, to study the Bible, to meet together in public worship, for our regular prayer meetings and fellowship, our readiness to bring the gospel to this world in which we live, to serve others, to support our pastor here, to support missions, home and abroad, and the list could go on. You see, we need to be prepared because we live 
in very much a dark world and hostile, as the Lord had already told the disciples they will face much hostility. But remember, the Lord Jesus was in complete control of everything that was about to happen. Now, this was written that it must be accomplished. This shows us the Saviour regarded not only as his life, but his death as the fulfilment of God's plan. To see also the fulfilment of prophecy when it says he was reckoned among the transgressors, we're told. It shows his death was substitutionary in character. And Isaiah 53, 12, as it reminds us, and he bore the sins of many and, bore the inter and he made intercession for the transgressors. That's what he came to do. He bore the sins of many. He bore your sin and mine, that we might be set free from sin and his slavery, set free to be forgiven, to be imputed a righteousness, not our own. It's all of him. It's all of his grace. It's all of his mercy. And here that our Lord was outlining this. But the disciples, of course, failed to understand all this. And at the end of his earthly ministry, and as he approached the cross, knowing what lay ahead, Christ prayed prior to entering the Garden of Gethsemane, which is later on in this uh, chapter here. And he prayed to the Father, I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory I had before, with thee before the world was. And you know, this is the most tremendous thing, that here that our Lord Jesus Christ was going to the cross. He wanted the disciples to share in his joy. You know that John 14 says, if you love me, you will rejoice because I said I go unto the Father for the, my Father is greater than I. He referred here not here to his role as a humble servant, not to his essential being. Our Lord knew exactly what was going to happen. He was going to the cross. It was a bitter cup. He was willing to drink it. Not my will, but thine be done. He laid aside his majesty. He took the cross and not the crown. He paid the penalty in full for sinners like you and I that we be set free, that through his blood that we might be reconciled, that he was a propitiation for our sins, that we through him might have eternal life, that we would know him, that we would know life eternal. And he promised this to the disciples, he promised it for us. It was a time to fulfill God's purpose in redemption as he became the propitiation for our sins and God's wrath was poured out on him to let the Holy Spirit do his work and to unleash the disciples as he did and to fulfill their calling. And he told the disciples he was going to die and he did. He told the disciples you'll rise again and he did. He told his disciples he'll be ascended into heaven and he did. He told the disciples he'd fill them with the Holy Spirit and he did. He did everything that he said. And later on they came to realize fully what he said and the God had used them. He declared everything to them and he gave them the commission, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, that mandate, that commission, he gave to them, he gives to us. He gives to us. It's still in force. So may we serve him with uh, real joy and expectation to know our Lord is with us and he enable us and let, him, let us thank him again that he's our servant king he is the one who gave himself for us, that we through him might have eternal life. Amen. Well, let's sing our final hymn tonight. And